right, so our first speaker is my good mate, Neil, Neil Haig. Hello. Great to see you here. Now, Neil's a fantastic spiritual and metaphysical artist. His talk today is Archetypes of Consciousness, Symbols of the Gnostics. So, please welcome Neil. Thank you. I, I feel like one of those robots. I've got about four mics on. Can you hear me okay? Here we go. Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction, Neil. That's great. Um, saved me a job, actually. Yeah, people who know me and know my work, I've spent probably 20 years um, illustrating and painting very interesting, bizarre subjects. You'll probably recognise some of the work for the work with authors like David Icke and, and other people. There's a chap at the back there, Pierre Sabac, another author I've done work with as well. Um, and basically, what I'm, I'm going to come at this from a completely different view. For, I mean, I've never talked at a megalithic conference before. Um, and I've, it's a new one for me, because I'm usually talking about deeper metaphysical subjects and symbolism, which I'm going to go into. But I, I, was, I haven't talked for quite a few years, actually. It's been a couple of years. And I went on Google. I, I, I Googled myself only the other week. And I, I'm now a professional footballer. <laughs> Um, and I was born in 1949, so I'm not looking bad for a 17-year-old, am I? There is a story behind that. I won't go into it, but that's bizarre. Yeah, the guy, Neil Haig, used to play for Rotherham, where I'm from, and my dad named me after him, that's why. So anyway, so he's a great painter as well. Um, anyway, so, and then, I, being me, as I, I usually try and get involved in stuff, I, I, I did a little stint in the newspaper. I was in the Daily Mail earlier on, um, was it towards the end of last year, um, it was a bit of a publicity stunt. I'm not really an angel walking around. You know, I don't have wings like that. But, you know, I'll come to some of the subjects. However, I, I went down there and did this. And um, th this did me no favours whatsoever, this, um, this thing here. Look, another angel, Neil, believes his mission means he can't have a relationship. That's me finished there, isn't it? The, ju the journalist completely mis misunderstood everything I talked about. Anyway, as, the, as they do. So when I saw this, I kept thinking of that. That was, the, and I kept getting ribbed all the time. In fact, somebody said to me, um, not long after, said, you look like Barry Gibbs, son. So I thought, anyway, yeah, anyway. So, um, but my background, really, I mean, I come from a very open background where my, my mother and my family were very much in, in, involved in spiritual churches back in, the, back in the day. So I'm very aware of all this kind of... Um, uh, idea that we can communicate with different levels, different frequencies, and, and other kind of entities, and, and so on and so on. So that was something that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, and what I've done over the years is I've tried to look for common ground in lots of Paleolithic art, maybe megalithic stuff, as you'll see. And I've been looking at symbolism deeply, and I'm going to I'm going to go into that. It's going to be quite. And some of it's going to be quite bizarre, so just, you know, just so you know in advance, some of it's going to be a bit unusual. But then again, you know, we've all been on the earth quite a while and probably many times over, so I'm sure some of you will know some of this stuff anyway. Um, one of my favourite ideas, and this is something I teach art and I teach it on a regular basis, is that I'm constantly talking about the imagination. Not as though it's just some throwaway thing, but it's actually an important aspect of everything that we do as human beings. But as creatives, of course, it's really important that we, we understand um, how powerful the imagination is. So that's going to come into, comes into the book that I wrote as well. You'll see at the end of the book, I really talk about that. Um, very recently, I put some work together for a CD cover for um, an album um, in Italy, and it summed up nicely for me the kind of things that I'm, I'm interested in, and the guy who, who wanted this made, made a good go of it. But the idea of shamanism and physics coming together through my own art, but through, you know, through endless other studies as well, and this idea that you know, this little area here, the, the physical world, is quite small compared to all these other worlds. And it's not something that's unusual, it's kind of a common theme. If you look through a lot of historical um, art and studies, um, you'll find that it's there a lot um, as you look at, um, you know, as, as you look into it. Um, another favourite artist of mine, William Blake, um, who was you know, totally, um, I would say, probably one of the greatest artists that ever lived, and that's pushing it out there. Um, I think every other artist was inspired by him. I was certainly inspired by him a lot. And the idea of the imagination being a state in itself, it's actually a very powerful state of existence. When you look at the, um, the Aboriginal world, and you think about the different worlds that we interrelate with, like the image I showed a minute ago, they were doing the same thing. I mean, this is a diagram of, of an Aboriginal world in terms of understanding the physical world, 
the, um, the human world and the sacred world. So I'm going to kind of tiptoe into these areas and this triangle symbol is going to become quite important later as you'll see because uh, what I'm doing at the moment is just skirting the surface of, of some of this symbolism. So um, what we have is a, a very, very simple diagram that kind of has been found in lots of Paleolithic art, in uh, Egyptian art, that explains the same kind of thing. So you've got the rainbow serpent, uh, and you've got the uh, Geb and Nut symbolism in Egypt and so on. The Orion belt, and Orion's going to come into this talk very, very deeply, I'm going to touch on that as well. So you've got all of that going on, and, it's, and it's, it's fascinated me for years. I mean, I've looked at all this stuff as an artist, as a, you know, as a researcher, and it's something that I've been passionate about. And just to sort of summarize in a piece of work I made a couple of years ago, the idea that we are, you know, so um, small in terms of our understanding of the greater world and energy fields that operate around us, which probably answers a lot of questions when it comes to megalithics and understanding why some of the stones were built, for what reason they were built and so on, because it all connects in that way. Um, that there's, a, there's this kind of wonderful, amazing uh, reality that exists all around us constantly and we can tap into it. And I love this quote by Manly P. Hall, he'll come up a couple of times. The idea of being able to walk through a library but not touch any of the books is something that we, not so much people in the room maybe, we're all, we're all coming from the same background, but I teach art to young people and it's something that it astounds me weekly that young people don't read today. Not as much as we, you know, we would have read or still do. So that's um, something that interests me as well. And then you might have come across things like this in the past. Have you seen the squatter man symbolism before, where it's all over the world? And there's been lots of attempts to try and, uh, you know, analyse what it really means. And by no means, I'm not, what I'm not going to do is say this is, these are the definitives, because I'm offering this to you, just to give you, get you to think. I don't have all the answers, of course I don't, and nobody does in the room, but it's just an idea. And I think from looking at this closely, it may well be, no matter which part of the world, it may well be that the ancients were looking at phenomena. They were looking at the idea of energy plasma exchange that was seen as a global phenomena. And this is going to come into the, uh, into the talk later, as you'll see. So the ancient world was very different. And then we have some of the most the, the oldest objects, you know, going back. There was something found in Australia recently. There was some, the oldest stone masonry. I forget where it was. Um, and it went back 100,000 years. This is 70,000 years in South Africa. And it's distinct because of the markings on the piece of uh, stone that relates quite possibly to the idea of duality, male and female and so on and so on. And again, it may well relate to the Orion constellation, which I'll come back to. And then you probably know all this, so just again, scratching the surface. I mean, who, I mean, who built the, the bloody pyramids? I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're all over the earth. They're, they're, they're absolutely amazing. And the idea that whoever built them tied in the circumference with the moon and the ratios is obviously something that maybe we might have to kind of stretch our imagination a little bit further to try and comprehend how these structures were built. So I'll come back to that as well later. I've been all over the world myself. I've, been, I've, you know, I've had the privilege of traveling around the last 15 years, probably 20 years, and I've been to Egypt, Peru, I've been to Bolivia and other places. And, you know, and I, again, I, I asked the question, you know, who, who built these structures? I mean, you, you, when you think about it, you think about the sheer size, and some of them are actually, you know, six to seven, seven million tons worth of stone. Um, it's, it's beyond beggar's belief. That one on the left is actually the Sphinx in Egypt. Um, I don't think personally that they were built by human beings necessarily. Um, and I'll throw this at you at some point with some imagery and you'll see why. I think there's a good chance that, well, human beings may be half human, half, half something else, but I think giants were involved massively, as you'll see from some of the slides. And some of my paintings, the other side of this, this is a quick painting uh, of Avebury called The Guardians of the Stones. There's also, from times when I've been at these places and I've done some meditation and I've thought about this and I've connected with other, other forces as such, um, I, I really, and you probably see it yourself, you see what looks like uh, pareidolia where you've seen faces in stones and things like that, actually could well be energy fields that are manifesting in that way. And I saw this very vividly of these kind of guardian spirits that were very much part of the stones and were manifesting the stones, using and interacting with some of the energy stuff I'm going to be talking about. So, and then you get stones like that. When I was in, I was in Peru and uh, Bolivia, and I'm thinking, 
Well, if, if that's been made by somebody, then they must have had one thing on the mind. However, if it's natural, then, um, then we've got some kind of very odd kind of forces at work, haven't we? You know, and I'll show you some slides later, not that far into this morning, which look at things I've captured on, in photograph in Peru, which, I mean, see what you think. I, I mean, I genuinely think that what I saw was something that was otherworldly, and you'll see why. So you get stuff like that, and then when I see this, I just think of bath time. I'm going somewhere with this, by the way. Don't, this is not just me. Just trying to keep this light. I forget where that is now. I think it was Norway. Um, yeah, somebody's got a sense of humour. And, and then, um, come on, slide. Yeah, and then there's these mysterious handbags. Have you seen these? I mean, there's loads of stuff on the net about it. I've got a theory I'm going to show you in a second. But these, these bags, I mean, here, they're, they are, you know, they're kind of floating around in, in uh, New, uh, New Mexico bronze, art, uh, bronze Age art. And then the kind of, you know, the uh, gold, what's it called? Uh, Gobelki, um, Tepi, uh, what's it called? in Tepi Kalepi. You know, they're kind of hanging around and they've got hands. They've always got somebody holding them. So I'd love to know what's in them. I've got an idea. I'll, I've got an idea. And again, if you look, I was in the British Museum not that long ago, and you've got these Byzantine pieces, and you've got these sort of, these are from the sort of, um, I would say the 900, 900 AD. They've got bloody handbags, the priests, you know. <laughs> what's that all about? It's hilarious. So, and then, and then I thought of that instantly. <laughs> and, but then, it got, then I got it. I, I, I realised what it was really all about. And it, this is the first time ever you're going to see this. This is what it really is. See, now, now, what's she doing with a handbag? Well, she got credit cards. You know, so there's, some, there's something going on with these ideas of gods and uh, the idea of the god carrying some kind of important stuff in these bags in the ancient world. I'm not going to go into all of that theory behind the royals, but, you know, you probably, you'll probably get my, my drift with that. It's interesting. She'll come up a few times this, this morning. So I'm happy at, at my ripe old age of 50 to accept the fact that I know absolutely nothing still, you know, and there's loads more to know, as always. But I'm kind of trying to go into some really deep and, and, and interesting symbolism, which will get you to think. So I'm going to go in two parts. So for, up until 11.30, I'm going to cover the first two parts. And then after, after that break, I'll go into a deeper, deeper symbolism that relates to Orion. And you'll see why. Okay, so where do we start? Um, the idea of Gnosticism, and Neil mentioned when he introduced me, the, the idea of Gnosticism and the idea of self-knowledge and, and Gnosis is something that's fascinated me anyway as a creative person. And when you look back and you go back in, into the ancient world and you think about the idea that um, religion has emerged out of, out of nowhere in many, in many ways and become quite cemented and dogmatic, however, there's been this kind of underground stream of knowledge which has been loosely labelled as Gnosticism throughout the ages and um, it's something that tends to come up to the surface and then get hammered back down, come up and then get hammered back down. It's been there for a long time and basically what interests me about it is the fact that I think the Gnostics were trying to communicate a greater understanding of the nature of the universe you know, on one level but they were also relating that to the human um, persona and the idea that we as human beings can become this this godlike um, anthrop uh, anthropomorphic being that would be existing on different levels of reality at the same time. One of the key things in Gnosticism is the um, let me go back one is the have I gone back? Yeah, there we are. Is the uh, pleroma, the plenum. And it relates to something that is quite simple and, you know, I'm not an etymologist, I've got a friend at the back of ears, he probably can help me out at some point later with this, but it's something to do with uh, the idea of plentitude and this field of plenty that exists all around us. And when you get into it and you start looking at it, it also relates to plasma as well, the idea that the, the majority of the universe is made up of plasma, made up of light, electricity in that sense, on many different levels. Um, it's not something that we would automatically assume without going into it and looking at it from a scientific point of view. It's living light, basically. And I think the Gnostics were, they were trying to emulate and present this idea through their, through their beliefs. So whether it's the sun, whether it's the um, northern lights, whether it's the plasma ball, as a quick example, this idea of electricity and plasma is what feeds absolutely everything that around us. Then there's the 
the idea of dark matter, which I'm not going to go into in great detail now because I haven't got the time, but the idea of dark matter, which makes up 95% roughly of the universe, which is another side to this, which may well relate to what the Gnostics called the, uh, the darkness. Even though I don't think it necessarily is a dark thing, but it, ha it holds deeper emotional subjects that relate to the underworld and all these other themes. So, um, you know, that's something else that the Gnostics were thinking about. And I saw this and I thought, this, this makes sense. This is, yeah, the, the shadow side, living its own dream and its own, yeah. There's a theme this morning, isn't there? Yeah. It wasn't intentional. So, um, yeah, it's, it's true. But going back to the pleroma, I mean, what, what's interesting about it is that the, the idea that worlds can be separated by boundaries, by veils, by, by perception actually more than anything when you look at it for what it is, is something that is the, is the, the biggest core belief of the Gnostics. They, they had an elaborate world that, that looked at these different levels and frequencies, gods and goddesses that was connected to all of this. And just to give you an idea, if you look at the, um, the idea of our universe or the, the, and the, the galactic center here, as, as a diagram, and the Orion region here, which is in the, um, in the Cygnus area as well, it's all in the same belt where the Milky Way is, we are, as a solar system are just in that area, we're in the arm of Orion, as, as you'll see when I come to some of the slides, so we're actually, we're actually part of something that is fundamentally affected the religious belief and symbolism and all these other subjects, we, as you'll see very clearly, that possibly relates, and I think it does relate to the Gnostic belief. And as, as Tesla said, if you want to understand the universe, think about energy, frequency, and vibration, because that's where it all connects. So let's look at the, some of the symbols of the Gnostics, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about um, the Cathars to a certain extent, but it ties in with their background a little bit. And one of the things that you need to know about the Gnostics is that um, the books that were found. I think they were found around sort of 2000, um, oh, sorry, they were found in 1940s, but they date, date back 2000 years, which were found in an area um, in near Qumran in some part, and some were found in Egypt. The biggest find was in Egypt. A lot of the texts and the scriptures that became the Dead Sea Scrolls seem to have this common theme that relates to um, duality and this idea of goodness and, and light uh, in a constant tussle between each other in a very elaborate way. And some of the ideas that came out of this, um, I, do, I think generally relates to the stars. It relates to the, the Gnostics' understanding of the star maps. One of the watermarks of the Cathars um, way back a thousand years ago was this image of the, um, the bull with the snake. And it was kind of spouting what they say is blue apples. And then there's a, there's a, a series of double crosses below it. This will become relevant, as you'll see, because it relates to the configuration, in my view, between Orion and Taurus. So um, the Gnostics understood this. The serpent itself is the Gnostic symbol, the feminine symbol, which relates to gnosis and, and awakening. And when you look at Orion and you look at the actual position of it and you think about how it's facing off against Aldebrand, the eye of the bull, this very much relates to that symbol, I think. There's, there's other stuff besides which I'll get into. I'm just, like I say, skirting at the moment. Hathor, the, the uh, Egyptian goddess, which stands for love, beauty, music, dance, motherhood, and joy, and all the rest of it, um, in many ways is very similar to the Gnostic goddess Sophia, which is the, obviously for those who know the Greek, is, is, um, it means wisdom in Greek, and other stuff besides. And I think that the, the Gnostic teachings, which came out of um, Iraq originally, as far back as that, I think they were hinting at this configuration between um, Orion and Taurus in many ways. I think the chalice comes from this in some ways. That's just my view. Um, and when you look at the cross symbolism, the Coptic cross, which the Cathars adopted, it goes way back. It goes back to Egypt. It goes back to the Ankh. Um, you've got all the variations of it, but this is to do with the, the flower of life and, the, the, again, the, the life relating to light in many ways. So um, this is going to come up a few times. And just to show that the, the, the cross does go way, way back beyond Christianity, uh, you probably know it goes back to the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, and um, the, the goddess uh, Baratana, or Britain, um, in that sense, with the scepter and the cross, does relate to that. 
I think the Canaanites were obviously um, the, the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. There was a Gnostic understanding in the, in their time as well. So uh, one other side to it that interests me also is this. Um, that, like I said, the, the 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 emerging of this belief coming out of this area here, which is in Iraq, and spreading over to China through the Prophet Mani, which became Manichaeism. Um, and this actually was the only religion not to survive. It's quite interesting because all the other Orthodox religions, like Judaism and um, Islam and, and Christianity, Hinduism, which are, you know, have their roots almost as common ground, one of them, which should have been or could have been a religion, was, was more or less snuffed out, and this was, this was the one. And this is the one that emerges from time to time, and it comes up, and it emerges, and it emerged as the Cathars, eventually. And the symbols of the Manichaeism is, um, is quite obvious when you look at it. It's got this idea of, the, again, the, the pole with the, the connection to something heavenly, the upper worlds and the lower worlds, on the tree of, the tree of life. Um, funnily enough, the, the Manichaean priests all wore white as well, just like the early Cathars who used to wear white. The priestesses did, not the later priests that were persecuted um, in, 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 uh, in the Occitane. So, um, you know, it's an interesting side connection. And then you, you go from Manichaeism into Armenia, which is where it really, really kicked off. And through Armenia, you end up with the Bogomils, of course. And that's the real history of the Gnostics. As they moved in through, through um, this area, uh, became the Palatians, Bogomils, and then separated and went into, obviously uh, entered into the south of France as the Occitane and became the Cathars. What we have here is a theme, like I say, of a, uh, a wisdom, a knowledge, that was constantly like going under the ocean, coming out to the surface and doing this. And the teachings were about the heavens, the connections to the stars, the idea of self-gnosis, the idea of um, the, 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 the greater teachings that would relate to, um, in a religious sense, would relate to the teachings of, of the one they call Jesus, without getting into all of that. But that was fundamental because it connects into it, I suppose, in some ways. And then when you look at some of the other areas, like... Um, um, the, the places in the Bogomil country, if go back to that one, you'll see that, you'll see, go back, go back, the goddess Yume, the same goddess, is represented with that um, image. My pointer thing has got a life of its own today, there we go. Um, you've got this image of this tree again, with the tree of life and connecting to some heavenly realms. The three stars are important, as you'll see, because I think it relates to the Orion constellation from my research. It could relate to other things. It could relate to the, the idea of a trinity as well. And then, again, with the, Bog the Bogomil tombs are also interesting because of the warrior aspects of it. And there's something on there that quite clearly looks like Orion with the bow. Um, but the Bogomil, as it says there, relates to the, uh, you know, the idea of the beloved, free, and the spirit again, and the energy and the light that I was talking about before. What is interesting, and I only found this out recently, is that when you look at some of the original crusading castles from the area that we know now as the Levant and the Lebanon, like um, Chastel Blanc and Crack de Chevaliers, they, interestingly, all of these places align up with the Orion constellation. In fact, one of the areas here, Bellatrix, seems to go off into the sea, and around this area, just off Byblos, where the term Bible comes from, they found underwater monuments and structures as well. So the land will have extended at some point and been further out before some kind of flood. And I can recommend a, book, a good book, actually, called The Mirrors of Orion by an American author, which talks about that in more detail. So um, that's fascinating. I found it fascinating because it tied in with more of the research. And then going back to the cross, the symbolism of the cross that the Cathar Cathars used, um, the, the original symbol, I feel, comes from the Metatron cube, this symbol here. And it relates also to Manichaeism as well, but it also relates to the Aphrodite symbol. And I think, obviously, you know, you can go into the rudiments of the 12 um, astrological signs. Actually, this is the European Union um, flag, which is a religious symbol, really. I mean, they know that it's religious, but um, the, the original 12 around the cross is quite important. And there it is. I forgot I got that slide. There we go. There it is. So the 12 labors, the 12 hours of the disciples, the knights, the tribes, and the, you know, the Occitane cross in its forms relating to that. So, um, will that move on? Yeah. And again, I'm not an expert. I love this book. You've probably all seen this book. Um, I think somebody's talking about Mitchell later, uh, but David Wood's book, um, Revelations, Genesis. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it, it's fascinating. Do you know what's fascinating about this? And I've been to the Cathar country many times, and as Neil knows as well, when you look at this, this area, this pentagram, there's no way on earth that those churches and those monuments could, could have been built where they were built without some kind of aerial view. According to David Wood as well, who's spent years researching this, somebody was looking at this from above. So there must have been some higher awareness in terms of consciousness that helped align these, these important places like Renilla Chateau, like Bougaresh. Uh, in, interestingly, I, you know, I, many, when I was a lot younger, I hiked. Um, I did about an 80 mile hike with a rucksack camping wild and went through all of these places and didn't even know that they, I didn't know the connection until afterwards. I'll tell you a story in a second about, about some of that. Um, so, yeah, in fact, um, here we are. Uh, this is me sitting in Keribus, which is um, actually, not to correct people that have studied the subject, but Montego was the famous, you know, the famous political last stand. Actually, Ker Keribus was the last castle to go eventually, much later. And um, if you ever go there, it's really, really peaceful. It had, it's got an amazing connection to um, what I felt when I was there. I felt, uh, I don't believe really ever, go, ever, ever go into kind of altered states and you have that moment of meditation. But I felt it was really connected to, the, to Qumran and to Palestine. It had a really strong uh, energy connection to it. And uh, while I was there at that time as well, I'd had a series of dreams. I won't go into it in detail now, but I do. I get a lot of imagery through dreams. And um, one of the things that I'd seen was a, I'd been taken underground in a dream. I didn't know this at the time as well. I didn't know that the castles had underground networks that connect some of the chateaus. But I'd been taken underground and um, there was a, a, a group of people quite clearly in hiding from a, from a darkness or a force that was coming to get them. And, and without going into detail, but the people in this dream, they had, um, you know, they had blonde hair, blue eyes. And I, I remember approaching them, walking towards them. And, and one, uh, what suddenly a little, a kind of a little fella came out of the crowd in this cave, came up to me and, and said, you know, you've got to help us, this, as dreams go. And um, he was pulling at my, at my you know, my clothing. And, um, and I quite clearly had some kind of, you know, chain mail. But what I noticed, which freaked me out, you know, it freaked me out even my dream, I w woke up eventually, was I had, I had what looked like a lion's paw, um, which is actually a Freemasonic thing I've been reading about. There's actually the lion's paw ceremony. I didn't know that until recently. But what, what is even more interesting for me is that um, not only is some of the cave art, some of the oldest cave art on earth, like the, 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 the one from uh, Germany of the lion humanoids, but the, the Lucas Empire with Star Wars decided to create a race of Jedis called Cathars and obviously coincidentally or not, made them into lion humanoids. And I just wonder whether there's a connection with this Gnostic stream and this knowledge and otherworldly forces that may well connect to this kind of idea of um, this lion headed uh, people or lion-headed consciousness. There's another side to it which I'm going to come back to as well, which I think ties in with it. But anyway, it was an interesting thing for me in terms of a dream. So there they are. They're the two castles. That's Keribus and Perpetus connecting to each other. And, um, and this theme of the light of the world and the Cathars carrying this light of the world, or to, as they said, to be the light of the world. I don't know whether you know much about them. We, I can't do a whole thing on them now. But the, the, you know, the, the idea that they... They, they shunned the, the, the then material world in their time um, for a life of um, chastity and celibacy in many ways and, um, and the fact that they, were, um, they would not entertain quite strongly the, the, the dominant, which was becoming a dominant force, which was the um, religion at the time, which was Roman Catholicism, which was leaving its mark on the world as a global empire eventually. Um, it's, it's fascinating because if they'd been allowed to flourish, in my view, if they'd been allowed to take off and stay as they were, I think two things would have happened. Roman Catholicism wouldn't have existed at all, whatsoever. And I think we would have had a very different understanding of the forces of creation. I'm talking about mainstream now, not necessarily something that is hidden and, and, and looked at in books secretly. I'm talking about mainstream if they'd been allowed to flourish. Um, a lot of the priests and the uh, priestesses originally were women, as you probably know. So what we were left with, eventually, um, the idea of the Cathars dealing with three, uh, the Gnostics, I should say, dealing with three bodies, the spirit, the soul, and the body itself, being very separate and trying to understand that through their teachings. 
Um, and what we eventually got left with um, was something very, very dark. As I said, they were carrying the light of the world. The opposite side to that, um, which is quite clear, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into this in detail, I'll leave this for other people, but um, the idea of when you go to Renan Le Chate and you walk into the church there, uh, Sonia's church, and you see Rex Mundi, sounds like somebody off Coronation Street, doesn't it? Or Asmodemus, or the devil. Um, and it says quite clearly there that this place is terrible. I mean, on one level, it's talking about that place being terrible, but it's also talking about this place, the world being a terrible place. And the Gnostics, the Cathars knew that. I'll come back to this again in a bit. And that's what you were left with, basically. It's a shocking image, but that, that's, what you, that's what you've been left with. That's what replaced Gnosticism globally. Um, without going into this, there's, I mean, there's loads of stuff coming out now, isn't there? You know, from chief cardinals to Michael Jackson, you know, everything's happening. Um, and it should, and it will do, because you can't keep a lid on, on the truth in that sense. Um, and I like what John Lennon said. So, I mean, talking about Christianity, am I in your way there? Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's where we're getting the feedback. Yeah. I'm, I'm going all Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, John Lennon, I agree, I agree with what he said. You know, the true Christians were the Gnostics, if you have that belief system in that sense. And the, one of the key things that the Gnostics taught about was this distraction, this idea of being distracted by, by this world when there was a world awaiting you beyond the veil, beyond the parameters of this illusion, as you'll see. So what I'm going to do now, quickly, I've got, what, have I got half an hour? I'm going to go through some of the story that relates to that, and it'll tie in with the, to the next part as well. So the idea of the, the story of Sophia and the Demiurge is the key pivotal part of the Gnostic symbolism and the Gnostic literature. And um, the Demiurge, as you'll see, I, I, you know, I, I think you're dealing with something that is completely artificial, as you'll see from the slides. The Sophia imagery, for me, is the goddess. It's quite simply the idea of, uh, you could trans translate it down to simple terms as Mother Nature on one level. Um, but it, there's, there's a lot more to it. And in one of my images here, um, where you've got the idea of the, the Aeon, the, the aeon or the upper aeons or the, the realms of light and plasma and the pleroma and, and the dream that took place. And they say in the story that Sophia gave birth through the Anthropos as she dreamt. She gave birth to another deity, almost an, a, a fetus-like creation, which she rejected instantly. She rejected this, this, um, this creature, this entity, this energy that she gave birth to. And... What they say in the, in, the, in, the, in the text is that the dream turned to a nightmare for her. And that nightmare became this, this, um, this force. And I think this force is very much centered around um, the Orion constellation, as you'll see. I think the forming of, of our, um, you know, our, our galaxy, or the, even more, our, the, the arm of Orion into the solar system, this, the Gnostics say were the work of the Demiurge, this, this creature here. Anyway, um, so in the story, as Sophia falls and she dreams, um, she, she creates this world, this reality, where thereby she has to eventually take form herself. She has to become something. Because as energy does, you know, as, as water becomes ice and cloud and things move through energy, she became um, what we would understand as um, the Earth, Gaia. And that's the story of Gnosticism, the story of the earth forming as an energy. And it's funny enough, when you look back um, at some of the uh, ancient um, depictions of the, of the goddess, also known as God's wife in many ways, I'll come back to that in a minute, but from Asherah and Is Isis Ishtar, these images, I think in many ways, and the Venus of Duffeldorf here, relates to the, the idea of entertaining the goddess, Sophia. It was quite a prominent thing. And so would be the, the also the other side of Gnosticism is the balancing of the male and female energy, which they refer to as the Christos. You have this order of Nous and Christos, Anthropos, these things. And these things came together to, um, to balance the energy of the earth as it formed according to the Gnostic teachings. I mean, a perfect example would be this of the Christ energy, as they called it, and, the, and, and Sophia merging together. And it's funny, when you go into the movies and you look at some of the symbolism, um, 
it's fascinating because it's there. They, they, they understand the Gnostic teachings because it does relate to other, other, other subjects like the Kabbalah, which I'll come to um, in Judaic texts. But you know, whether, whether it's the, um, the fifth element here with Lalo or whether it's Jupiter ascending or the Matrix trilo trilogies, this is, you know, this is Sophia and this is Christos. Um, same with her and what's his name? Um, I forget his name. The guy was in Die, in Die Hard. Bruce Willis, that's it, thank you. Um, and it's more clearly in the Tron legacy because you've got the, the demented imposter, the demiurge. You've got the divine creator, which is um, the guy that created the, the thing in the first place. The Anthropos Christ and Sophia coming together as aeons to, to change the reality. Um, and then, you know, the, the other side of this, the darker element in movies, you'll see the, the Demiurge, the Lord Ruler, the Archons, the Archangels, in a whole range of movies, without going into detail, you'll see them appearing, and some of these will come, will come up again later. So, and also another really interesting film um, was is Darren, Darren Arafonsky's film, which is called the, um, the Fountain, which has got some really lovely symbolism about the creation of, um, not only the creation of the world, but the idea of the Tree of Life, and the fact that we're living in parallel realities simultaneously, and this figure here, which is played by Hugh Jackman and Rachel Wise, the Adam and Eve figures in the story, is absolutely beautiful if you ever get a chance to watch it. It's purely Gnostic in its interpretation. Um, and again, um, you know, it, William Blake's work, and a whole range of religious uh, illustration that would relate to the idea of... Um, the, the goddess Sophia. So I put Adam fast asleep there because he, men are usually are, aren't they? You know, in that in that respect. But the serpent, the serpent, office means serpent, and the Gnostics. All these all these cults that were all Gnostic cults all relate to this this understanding, and the Abraxas symbol goes with that as well. That's why the Gnostic symbol of the serpent was important, and that's why it's there in the in the middle of the Sukkotash. You've got the Gnostic symbol in this this bowl. This ceremonial bowl and the 16 Gnostics relate in my view to the double infinity symbol which relates to the let there be light and the idea of enlightenment in that way in infinity it's no no um, surprise that that looks like the the eye symbol or the human eye in that sense and there's much more to it I'm sure besides that there's a ton of other stuff you could relate it to especially in the tarot with the, you know, the strength card. Again, this, as you'll see, this is Sophia and the Demiurge, and I think that the octo, the language of light, relates to this kind of understanding of controlling the, the, the rage and the darkness through light. And the, uh, the alama, the, uh, the position of the sun as it moves around the earth, creates this, this symbol as well. So the idea that um, this light, the, the, what the Cathars, the Gnostics were teaching about, was very evident in everything that, the, that, that was um, around us all the time. The idea of the pleroma, the universe, the stars, all these things were obviously uh, edited out by mainstream religions like Roman Catholicism at the time because they didn't want the general population having this connection to everything that would make them you know, aware of everything else. They didn't want that. They wanted them to have a fixed series of beliefs, so, um, which is obvious. And that's my painting of the Anthropos, my image of the idea of the forces coming together to create a new earth here. And the idea also that we are connected, I, I haven't got much on the pineal gland in here, but the idea of the third eye and the pineal gland connecting to the upper aeons and the moon not allowed, being allowed passage. I'll come back to the moon very briefly as well. So this is a diagnostic diagram of the uh, Anthropos and the, and the upper worlds of the, um, the Aeons and the lower worlds beyond this veil here, this, this um, boundary as they called it. And the fall that took place basically through not only through starting through Sophia's dream which became the nightmare but also the fall of humanity which would tie in with that in, in a religious sense. There is a connection to all of this. And another simple diagram would be to see humans here trapped with Sophia between this all-encompassing pleroma and the realms and the world of the Demiurge, the, the architect, the great architect, which, ironically, is the name of the, is, which is God in the, in the Bible. That's the name for this, the Demiurge. So trapped between two worlds. It's almost the infinity figure of eight, but it's not quite. And as some of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls point out, the forces that are working against humanity, according to the Gnostics, 
um, they, were shad they were made of shadow and limitless and lived in chaos. And some of my art, some of my imagery that I've made over the years trying to understand this um, gives you that idea of a fall from a, um, you know, an upper world into this lower world here and these forces that interact all around us all of the time. Here's a piece of text from the uh, hypostasis of the Archons, which is interesting because it sums up what I was saying earlier about the aborted fetus. But what also interested me when I started looking at this was that the, um, the image of the Demiurge was resembling a lion. And that's where we get the other imagery that relates to the lion, as you see. So the Gnostic Demiurge, or Yaldaboeth, or Angra Manu in, uh, in Zoroaster belief, is very much the same thing. And here you have the sun and the moon and the serpent and the... What it is, in many ways, is, is a chimera. It's a, it's a virus. This is a, an amalgamation of different forces. Uh, it looks very angry, doesn't he? Angry, man, you there. It looks very scary. Um, and this force is the demiurge in itself. And again, as a, a great book by John Lam Lash, have you, if you've ever seen the book, not in his image, he's talking about, again, Sophia desire to cause the thing that has no innate spirit of its own to be formed into likeness and rule over primal matter. Again, it's lion-like in appearance. Um, arrogant, ignorant of everything else around. I mean, as he points out in the book, it's almost like having a, somebody building a world, of, uh, uh, a huge kind of, imagine somebody building a solar system and then announcing as these forces were at work, these celestial forces, that, um, that they created all of this. It's all their creation. It's a little bit like a foreman turning up at the building site while all the builders are going for it. And, and, the, and he turns up and says, by the way, I created all of this, all of it. And they're all thinking, yeah, really. Um, you know, so it's that kind of thing. It's the arrogance of the demented deity that, funnily enough, can be seen everywhere, as you'll see. Uh, the banks, the Bank of England have got, has got the demiurge symbolism. It's why it's on so many stately homes. They're controlling the flow of money through magic. I won't go into this in great detail now, but it's, it's being controlled through that. Dr. John Dee, one of the greatest magicians that lived under Elizabeth I, that's his emblem, that was his, his badge. And it's no surprise when you look at one of the oldest secret societies, Delta Kappa Persilion, which actually is a name for one of the belt, star, belt stars in Orion, um, was created by this chap, Britton Haddon, who formed the Time magazine. Um, they know all this stuff because this is the Demiurge again and the Eye of Providence and I'm going to come into this, some of these symbolism as we get into it. So, you know, that's, that is probably the oldest secret society in America um, in terms of modern age symbol, uh, secret society. All presidents were a member of it. Um, Dr. John Dee, this is fascinating, but Dr. John Dee's use of scrying mirrors, I don't know whether you've ever seen that, um, anybody who's got Netflix, I haven't, but you've seen those, I think it's called Black Mirror by, um, what's his name, the, I can't remember his name, Charlie Brooker, Charlie Brooker, Charlie Brooker that's it. Uh, some of those episodes on there are fascinating in terms of use of magic, but Dr. John Dee's scrying mirror um, is this basically, that's what it is. I mean, you've got a whole generations of young people now scrying on a, on a you know, weekly basis, daily basis, second by second. Um, and if, what, what goes beyond this? You know, what is connected to these other forces? Um, you know, what lives out there that is working through these devices? It's just a question I throw out because I've seen it with so many young people. I've seen their demeanor change. You know, the, the, the alpha waves are changing because of this technology. And you see the symbolism again in the movies of this kind of demented chimera virus uh, which manifests as the Agent Smith virus in the Matrix movies, which is, I think, well, the Wachowskis who wrote the Matrix, I, th I think at their core, they are, they are Judaic, but I think they're, they're giving us Gnostic teachings through the films. It's quite obvious what they're doing. You know, so this idea of a human becoming a, um, a cyborg is a, is a common theme through the Gnostic, not so much through the Gnostic teachings, but it seems to be this idea of an artificial intelligence that is manifesting in this world and giving us a, a different view of reality, a distorted view of perception, some of my art. And going back to this image again, the idea of um, the, 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 the uh, imagination being distorted and twisted and the, the world that has been created is almost like a it's like an illusion of an illusion. It's a fake world of a fake world in many ways. And you'll see this, this um, energy as, as inorganic it's, it's quite obvious that in, when you look at it, for the different forces in the universe, whether it's electromagnetic, whether it's nuclear, then the inorganic substance, which is weak nuclear and strong nuclear, seems to be where this 
this energy seems to dwell. And I'm going to show you some slides in a second and see what you think, see what, see what you think these are. But I had the privilege of being in Peru not that many years ago. And I went to Lord Amaru's The Devil Gate, which is on the border of Bolivia and Peru, which is back in Peru. And we went there at dusk and... Um, um, I won't go into the, the, the detail. I was with a group of people that were connected to a tour that, that David Icke was on and giving. And we were, um, we were led by a series of shamans. And um, what happened that night as we got there, um, a young fellow that was with us on the tour, an Australian chap, he, um, he and a few others left the party that we were with and, and went running over to this gateway. And eventually, as we got there, I mean, I found him crouched in that pillar there. You see that kind of, that structure? They're like pillars. There's a face there, actually, in a mouth. That's the mouth that I'm standing in. And he was crouched down in it, and he was, you know, he was obviously starting to get very distressed. And he thought what he was having is a euphoric kind of um, feeling of awareness and being awakened. And um, turns out, in the end, um, as it got really serious, he was, he was under some kind of influence. And uh, he was pulled out of there by the people that we were with, and he'd gone into some kind of epileptic fit at one point. And um, there was a group of people with David Icke at the time, and they, they managed, I mean, there was basically, I witnessed a, an exorcism on, on, a, on a big scale. I even saw some of the energy that came, came off and around the, this young fella. The next day, he, he, he still didn't remember what had happened to him. He was completely oblivious, and he thought he'd had some amazing experience. Well, if, for the 30 people that witnessed it, they weren't amazing. <laughs> he was banging his head on the rock, you know, and he needed to be held down and, and dealt with. Um, anyway, we go back the next day, and we find out that from the locals that um, the place is notorious for its, um, not only its history, and what kind of resides there, as you'll see, but also the fact that people had gone missing, people had gone crazy, which was what was happening to this young fella. Uh, if he'd not been, if there'd been nobody with him, he, he would have disappeared. He'd probably gone running into Lake Titicaca and that'd be the last of him, you know, you'd seen of him. Um, and it was interesting, uh, really, that what they said, the locals said, that this place was where people had disappeared completely. They'd gone through a gateway, a portal. Um, anyway, so we went back, we wanted to go back and, um, we, we did some kind of ceremony work around the other side of it. And um, I don't know whether you can see there, but that's, that's the back. The other side is where the door is. When you go around the back, there's this, um, that's, that's where it would be on the other side. And if you look closely, can you see the configurations of the rock? And I don't think this is natural. I think forces have made this. Can you see this face there with the eye, the nose and the chin looking up? If you've got it down on the ground, if you got up against it, it looked like a dinosaur skull. Look, the teeth and the eye. And then at that end, you can't quite see it, but it's a dragon's head. And this is like the body of the dragon. It's a fascinating uh, place if you ever get a chance to go. So we went round the back, and there's a group of us holding hands as you do, you know, in a big circle, doing our lovely thing that we did. And um, this is what appeared eventually. This thing started to appear in the sky above us, bursting through the clouds. Can you see it there? See the head? inside the head. It turned into a skull eventually. I've got a better picture coming up next. Can you see that? See that face within a face? It looks like a grey alien. It looks like a kind of an entity with teeth. It looks like a Cheshire cat, but it morphed and it morphed and it eventually became a skull. This, these are the forces, these are the archons or the jinn in the Arabic that the Gnostics were talking about. This is the energy that can interact and become either fire or air. It works with the elements. It can possess a rock as it can possess a human being. And they live in those substances, especially ancient places. And that's what I witnessed with a whole bunch of other people. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much time I've got. We've got 15 minutes, is that right? Is that, yeah, I'm gonna whiz through some of these. So, just food for thought. Um, there's another side to this as well, this idea of falling again, the idea of falling with Sophia through the darkness. And the idea of titans battling through the planets as well as the solar system moved and, and settled into its, into its various different states that have changed through aeons, as the aeons are say. Um, you know, and, I, and I've gone into this in my fiction stories over there through Moonslayer and Aeon Rising. But as these forces settled and eventually um, you get all this symbolism that relates to uh, this epic age, which is called the Age of Titans. And you see it. In, you know, in, in the corporate world, um, the mother of all monsters, Starbucks, <laughs> there she is, um, which in the story, she married the king of Jerusalem, which was actually Typhon, 
you know, in the story. It wasn't, he, he gave, they, between them, the father, the, the mother and father, an awful lot of um, terrible creatures like Cerebus. And, um, and then, you know, uh, people like Argos, not the shop, um, you know, did, did battle and slayed this creature. I find it fascinating now that, you know, these corporate companies, you know, seem to be obsessed with all of this. Um, as you'll see there, you know, that's just a, a quick range of them. You know, Prometheus is important because of the idea of giving what was left of um, the light or the knowledge to, um, to a very, very, um, I would say, an artificial creation, uh, the Homo sapien species, so they could have this access to higher knowledge and merely not be an animal. Oh, yeah, the Firefox, Mozilla Firefox. Again, I think this is symbolism that relates to Orion and, and the and also to the, um, the, the constellation of the fox, but it's also this idea of engulfing the world. So Prometheus bringing the fire, which is on the Reuters building in New York, it's in endless places, um, and the idea of Prometheus in the Frankenstein sign story, um, of giving that to, well, its creation was Adam, wasn't it? Um, the, the idea that the knowledge was not only given to humans, but human DNA was tampered with at some point. I think ties in quite nicely with this whole idea of, idea of the fall and the idea that there was different species and different races and different, you know, um, different kinds of humanoids on Earth at one time. It's almost like a movie. There was a movie one time. It was an amazing movie, like an epic, like Lord of the Rings. And all of a sudden, that came to an end. And now you've got Groundhog Day instead. You know, you've got a different version of reality, which is not as great as the ancestors and the ancients had, in my view. Um, and then the, the images of Prometheus is quite interesting because he seems to be building some kind of, um, you know, the, the symbolic idea of building the human. And when I saw a movie recently, um, have you seen this? Some of you probably have, but this Alita, um, this, this big franchise, James Cameron film. It's actually, again, it's the Frankenstein symbolism and the fall, because she's called the battle angel that's fallen. So again, it's the idea of the, and I think, you know, um, I think you might find this interesting, Pierre, you know, the idea of the fallen angel. Again, there she is. And actually, Alita is chosen one. Alita from Hebrew means the high above or the excellent. So there's this idea of, being once a different um, type of human or a higher energy that fell through this frequency and arrived at this kind of level that we're at now. Funnily enough, in the story, she is the ultimate fighting machine that's forgotten all of her skills, you know, so she gets them back. And then I came across this really lovely book by uh, Ariadne Mayer, which is all about gods and, um, and robots. And it's fascinating the amount of robots that have you know, that ties in with the gods. Not only that, but in terms of medieval, medieval period, but going further back. And um, I don't know whether you've seen the Blomkamp's work, but it, there's a whole series of YouTube films that are all about the fallen race and Adam being a, um, a, you know, a, a cyborg, a bit like me today with all the wires. Um, and, and the idea that, again, the, 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 the human species, I'm not saying we're robots, by the way, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there was once a time when we were much more in tune with, with nature and the earth and we're becoming, interestingly, more and more connected to this cyborg world. My friend at the back there wrote a brilliant book um, recently called Holographic Culture, and he goes into some of this in terms of the semiotics. Uh, it's fan fantastic. And as, as I agree, I mean, Adam is a recreation using the genetics of a fallen race. I think that's absolutely spot on. And I don't know whether you've seen this, but when you look at some of the Michelangelo sculptures and you turn them upside down and colour them a little bit differently, that's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, what was he doing? The same Michelangelo made mistakes. You know, he had to put horns on Moses, on the Vulgate. Michelangelo didn't make mistakes. That's, that's like saying George Lucas, you know, made mistakes. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, so there's something going on there. And then there was Westworld. You've seen that probably. That's a HBO. Um, and that's got, again, connections to Adam, the creation of Adam. I'm going to whisk through these now very quickly. Comes up in Prometheus, which again, it's the same stuff in the movies. And there we have Hephaestus, the, the, the Vulcan in, um, in Roman um, myth, who is the creator of all of these kind of cyborgs and gods that, that have a kind of add an effect on, on um, maybe on the effect on where we are now, but also they're part and parcel of the, the demiurge of the Gnostic teaching. Vulcan worked for Zeus, basically, and Zeus was the demiurge in that sense. Um, and so what's interesting is that from these race of giants, some of these say were born in Philorma, like Talos. You've heard of Talos in, remember that film with the Jason and the Argonauts? Um, they were born in Philorma. What does that mean? That means they were, they were, they were cyborgs from the start. And um, 
What's interesting is that the military in America, obviously, are developing these kind of uh, body armors. This, this is called Talos, actually. That's the, the name for it. Surprise, surprise. Um, and, and when you look at some of the imagery in the films, this is from the, um, the film the Tit with, with the Titans in it. What's it called? The Eternals. And uh, you look at that and you think about the way in which the police are being kitted out in some parts of the world, like in Mexico. Um, there's this kind of move towards this ancient epoch, which was focused on the fall, and the creation of um, this kind of uh, fallen race, the gods of that, that era. Aristeos, they say, was, um, was one of those giants that was turned into a, a, a dung beetle. You've seen the Egyptian symbolism. I find it quite interesting when you look at the dung beetle and you look at Darth Vader. I mean, you know, just not a stretch of the imagination a little bit to try and understand where this is going. Um, and then DARPA, I won't dwell on that, but DARPA, the, the Defense Advanced Research Project, which is, you know, the branch of the Pentagon, which is creating this technology, is definitely taking us somewhere where we, um, which I don't think we need to go or where we should be going, but we are going down that route into a fully fledged, possibly a robot military. And it's, it's happening right now. In fact, the, you know, it was in the paper the other day that the EU wants a robot army to challenge China, apparently. Why don't they just, why in this country, they, they can't even sort Brexit out, can they? Never mind anything else. But anyway, I'll come back to that. So um, the, the idea of, I mean, like I said today, I'm all kitted up with the mics, but the idea that everything human is connected to this fake reality, this, this cyborg, demiurge inspired um, reality is, is becoming quite obvious once you start to look at it for what it is. Loving the Alien. I saw this in the newspaper the other day as well. Where I don't know if you've seen her. Um, her name is Michaela Sousa. And she's not real. But everybody that trolled her on, the, on Instagram thought she was real. She's been starring in a couple of adverts for Nissan and things like that. So th this, this world is going into this. It's going deeper and deeper into this artificial world. Um, time is it? Five minutes. Okay. And again, you know, the Samsung technology, the age of Orion and all that kind of thing. Again, we're looking at that that I showed you before. Oh, and did you hear about the Uber driver that killed people? And he said it was the app that made him do it. Did you see that? That was in America recently, not that long ago. Um, I mean, when you listen to him, I mean, he, look, he looks a little bit, you know, out there, doesn't he? Uh, but it's interesting how the app made him do it. I think you're talking about the technology and also what forces are working through the technology in that sense. I mean, I've had some strange experiences with technology. You, probably, you might have had stuff where it's, it's, it's almost as though, you know, you'll be on, a, you're on the phone to a friend talking about a van or a, a car, and next thing, the next day on social media, you're getting all these ads about vans and cars because it's, it's, it's almost like a living creature. You know, the, the, the thing that's in your hand or what the young people are using is very much alive in its own, in its own sense. It's alien in my view. And um, the neuro neurologist, Eden Alexander, said that. And I think that's true. I think that, um, I think the interface between computers, as they are today, and the brain are getting nearer and nearer to the point where we are almost um, summoning the demon in many ways. We can, actually, we, can actually, we can actually interface, and they'd love us to interface more closely, the forces at work, the ones that I showed you. I think the forces at work would love us to become fully-fledged cyborgs in that sense. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, that was a bit of a joke. I was having a laugh with a friend, uh, you know, a bit dire, isn't it? But, you know, yeah, life on the dole after a nuclear war, Channel 5, 8 o'clock. You've seen those programs. They're obsessed, aren't they, with them? It's, you know, it's, it's, anyway, that's another subject. But, yeah, just to go back to Gnosticism, Sophia and Eve, this is the, she's, she's got full status now in Saudi Arabia, Sophia. She's actually, a, you know, she's got a passport and everything. Um, yeah, I won't say any more. Um, and Pandora and, and so on and so on. Right at the end now, I'm coming to the end. And again, back in medieval times, you'll see all of these, these uh, attempts to try and recreate these devil-like robots. And when you look at armor and the samurai, I, find, I mean, I'm not an expert, but when I look at it, and I, I know from one thing, I did some study that the samurai clans actually named themselves or they were connected to the stars of Orion, the, the opposing forces of Betelgeuse and Rigel, from what I've seen in certain areas. But just look at the actual, you know, look at, these, look at this that was given to Henry VIII by Maximilian. And then look at stuff like this, and it just makes you wonder um, what kind of forces have been at work in the background for a very, very long time. By the way, I'm joking when I say that. I mean, that's my little 
Twitter joke, you know. Um, but it's true. I mean, maybe it's true. I mean, who did build the pyramids? I mean, do we really think that humans were, you know, an ox and, and were pushing and pulling? And there must have been something else at work, maybe a technology. I think the giants, you know, built some of these megalithic structures personally. Um, okay. And by the way, uh, Optimus Prime was called Orion Pax originally, so somebody changed his name. So I'm going to go into this in more detail after the break. We're going to stop in a couple of minutes. I'm going to look more closely. Um, and just, to, you know, Orion appears everywhere. It's just as prevalent as all these other things. It's on everything. What I found interesting at the moment is this Orion Cloud uh, platform launch and Orion Nebula AI um, and the idea that, and this is based in China, by the way, um, and Asia, and the idea that the, for some reason these corporations are pushing the Orion constellation or the name Orion for all sorts of reasons and after this break I'm going to show you why. NASA I think give us the clue as well and it does relate to other things it comes back to megalithics and all sorts of stuff but the Orion uh, project which was I think was actually eventually stopped on one level and went down a different route but it, it focused on Saturn instead eventually but there's a connection there between Orion and Saturn which we'll come to. Okay so I'll leave you with that for the break. Well, wow, fantastic. Yeah, thank uh, you. We'll have half an hour. Yeah, okay. Yeah.